Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I join my colleague in rising in strong support of this strong bipartisan reform-oriented Water Resources Development Act bill. And in doing so, I really want to thank and salute Senator Boxer for her leadership more than anyone else. She got us to the floor today with a strong, solid bill. As Senator Boxer mentioned, very early on in our discussions about the work of the EPW Committee this Congress, we set a good, solid, bipartisan, reform-oriented water bill as our top immediate goal in terms of something the committee could produce and actually pass into law. In fact, those discussions even started between she and me in particular before the start of this Congress. And of course, they continued and they ramped up in a meaningful and substantive way. And through that give and take and through that real commitment to work in a bipartisan fashion on infrastructure, on jobs, on things we can agree on, uh, this bill came out of that. Again, as she mentioned, we don't agree on everything. We don't agree on everything in the committee. And that committee is often very contentious and divided along ideological lines. But this is a subject where we can agree and work productively together because this bill is about infrastructure and jobs, and certainly we can come together around that. And that's what it's fundamentally about, water infrastructure, commerce, and jobs. That's why the Alliance for American Manufacturing said almost 24,000 jobs will be created for every billion dollars invested in levees, inland waterways, and dams. And this bill does several billion dollars of that. That produces jobs because it's building the necessary infrastructure we need for waterborne com commerce. And ultimately, that core, that theme, that common goal is what brought us effectively together. The proof of that is, I think, seen in the committee consideration of this bill. As you may know, the EPW committee is a divided committee. On many key issues before us, we are very divided between Republicans and Democrats. And yet, because of this focus in the bill on maritime commerce, jobs, infrastructure, uh, we won an 18 to 0 committee vote to report the bill out favorably and bring it to the floor. Let me talk for a few minutes about exactly what is in the bill. And I want to go through the highlights, and I think they can best be summarized by focusing on 10 specific points. What's in the bill, what the bill does, sometimes, just importantly, what's not in the bill, and what the bill doesn't do. First of all, the bill does not increase deficit and debt in any way. No negative impact on deficit and debt. And related to that, secondly, no earmarks in the bill. It's the current rules of both conferences not to support and sponsor earmarks. No earmarks in the bill. What does the bill affirmatively do? Well, number three, it authorizes 19 significant projects for flood protection, navigation, and ecosystem restoration. And yet at the same time, even on the authorization side, we create a mechanism, and I thank Senator Barrasso for contributing this important element to the bill. We create a BRAC-like commission to deauthorize some old projects which are not being acted upon, which are not getting built, and so because of that new BRAC-like deauthorization commission, even on the authorization side, we should have a net neutral impact on authorizations. So the way we have structured it, we shouldn't even be increasing overall net authorizations. Number four, we've made substantial progress and reforms to harbor the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund and spending on dredging and other harbor maintenance trust fund projects. As Senator Boxer mentioned, it's an, been enormous frustration to many of us that this so-called trust fund is really raided every year 
so that even in a good year, half of the supposedly dedicated revenue from industry into those trust funds is used for other purposes. Again, this is revenue from the maritime industry, supposed to be protected, supposed to be dedicated for dredging and other delineated purposes, but even in a good year, half is used for other things with deficit spending. We've negotiated with all members of the Senate, including the leaders of the Appropriations Committee, and I think we have made substantial progress, a big move in the right direction, so that we ramp up Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund spending for dredging and other delineated purposes. In a few years, between now and roughly 2019, 2020, we have a steady ramp up. We spend more of that trust fund on the agreed upon delineated purposes every year, building toward full spend out of the trust fund. Again, this is the product of a lot of discussion and goodwill negotiation with other members of the Senate, including leaders of the Appropriations Committee, and that's a major element, positive element of this bill. Number five, we also make important reforms and changes to the Inland Waterway Trust Fund. There again, there has been real frustration that those Inland Waterway Trust Fund projects have been languishing, have not properly gotten the resources they need to be completed and get off the books. We make real reforms on the Inland Waterway Trust Fund side that will have important positive impacts to get those important projects built. Six, we provide non-federal sponsors of many of these projects more project management control in both the feasibility study and the construction phases of projects. This has been an idea and a standalone bill of Senator Bill Nelson of Florida and myself, and we incorporated that reform, that pilot project, into this WERDA bill so that in, uh, on a sort of experimental basis in several significant cases, we're going to ask the non-federal sponsors to take over project management control, and we think that's going to allow these projects to get built quicker and uh, more efficiently for less money. Seven, we require more accountability of the Corps of Engineers on project schedules. We increase public disclosure of internal Corps decisions, and we actually penalize the Corps for the first time ever when they miss significant deadlines. Again, Senator Boxer mentioned this. We had discussions right out the box and came to the agreement that we're not going to lower the bar about environmental review. We're not going to substantively change any environmental or other requirements. What we are going to do is just make sure whatever agencies involved do their work in a timely, expeditious way. And that has to start with the Corps of Engineers in terms of these projects. And we do that with much heightened core accountability. Number eight, in a similar vein, we accelerate the NEPA and project delivery process to ensure that projects are not endlessly held up by government bureaucracy and by tangles in red tape. Again, it's exactly the same approach and agreement that I mentioned with regard to point number seven. We're not changing standards, lessening standards, lessening requirements. We are appropriately streamlining the process and saying everybody works on deadlines and the federal agencies involved have to work on and respect those deadlines as well. And if they miss them, over and over and over, there are going to be negative consequences. And that's an important reform element to this bill. Number nine, as Senator Boxer mentioned, we provide an innovative financing mechanism for water resource projects, as well as water and wastewater infrastructure pro projects. It's called WIFIA because it's modeled on the TIFIA program on the transportation side. And it's very much the same basic idea. TIFIA has long been 
a model to build public private partnerships and help finance important transportation infrastructure projects on the last highway bill last year that i helped work on the senator boxer led on we expanded the tiffia program here we're using the same positive model for a wifia program and number 10 finally we provide more credit opportunities for non federal sponsors either in lieu or financial reimbursement or cross crediting among projects so they can more reasonably meet their wetlands mitigation and other needs wetlands mitigation requirements have grown much more onerous and expensive over time in a lot of places of the country including louisiana this is simply intended to give people local government private industry others more options not to lower the standard for that mitigation but more options to meet the standard to meet the goals in a more efficient and less costly way and so we do that do that through these credit opportunities those are the important key 10 highlights of the bill and again i think it is a genuine bipartisan reform oriented effort that is at its core about water infrastructure, waterborne commerce, jobs, and hurricane and flood protection. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, the clearest proof of that, I think, is committee consideration and committee vote. There are not many things that ever get an 18 to zero vote in the Senate EPW committee. This did, strong conservatives, strong liberals, 18 to zero. And I'm very proud of that and think that gives us a very productive path forward. Speaking of the path forward, let me just underscore and emphasize what Senator Boxer has laid out. We want to have votes. We want to process amendments. There is no goal here to frustrate that in any way by either me or Senator Boxer or anyone else. Uh, but to really get that ball rolling, in my opinion, the best way to get there is to start, <laughs> to start taking up amendments, to start having votes, to build that momentum. So what we would like to do and what we're going to propose in the very near future is first, if possible, if our substitute amendment can be adopted by unanimous consent to be the underlying bill. It is non-controversial. It incorporates the ideas and suggestions of dozens of senators. There is nothing controversial in it. In fact, the only thing it does is remove some potential controversy in the bill. So we're going to ask the full Senate to allow us by UC to adopt that as the underlying bill. And then immediately, we're also going to ask to have debate and votes on three or four beginning amendments. And those, in fact, I, I believe are going to be non-germane amendments. I think that underscores and illustrates our goodwill about processing amendments, getting it going, taking amendments, having votes, and getting through this process. Now, I would suggest, as Senator Boxer did, that we try to continue to focus on the important subject matter of the bill and not endlessly or needlessly go far afield. But I do think that proposing these amendment votes straight out is an important gesture of goodwill to set the right precedent and tone for a full open debate on the floor. And so that's what we're going to do. And so as soon as that UC request is drafted and ready, uh, we'll come to the full Senate with that. And if we can gain consent for that, I think it will start us on a very productive path both to consider the bill and to process amendments and have votes. Clearly, those amendments wouldn't be the end of it by far, and we're already teeing up some amendments to come right after that to get those up, to debate those maybe tonight, to vote on those as soon as we can, perhaps in the morning, and go from there. So that's my goal and expectation in terms of the near future, which Senator Boxer shares, and we'll return to the full Senate, uh, hopefully quickly, uh, with that request. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I 
yield to the distinguished senator from Rhode Island. 